We're just waiting for Tom Thompson to come in and sit down so we can start the meeting. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. It is 8 on this March the 19th, 2024. We will, as usual, start our meeting with our chaplain prayer and pledges, and we have Ralph Dawkins here to lead us in both. If you'll please come forward, and if all of you will stand, please. Good morning. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to invoke prayer and your word into this meet gathering of city officials and leaders and concerned citizens. Your word declares in Jeremiah 29, 11 that you already know the plans that you have for us, plans for prosperity and plans not for evil, but plans that will bring us a future and a hope. So during this Lent season, may you lead and guide them with wisdom, courage, and integrity to hear the concerns of these citizens and make, and make decisions that will benefit our city and our community. I ask that you would move mightily through them today. So come into this room and cause them to have a productive meeting and let there be a sense of agreement and cooperation to come peacefully, to come to peaceful solutions for the benefit of our community. So I lift up the mayor, her staff and assistants, the city council, the city manager, and every person and department that is instrumental in leading and directing our city. I pray for the police chief and the entire police force, the sheriff's department, that they may continue to protect and serve the residents of our city. I pray for the fire chief and the fire department and all the first responders who serve our city. And even in their executive session, may they think and strategize in ways that will achieve great results. Lastly, I pray, Lord, that you would continue to give our city and community economic prosperity, safety. May you draw in and attract to our city industry, businesses, corporations that will produce jobs and revenue and help it to grow and prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to City Council and the first of our proclamations today, which is for the San Angelo Federal Credit Union's 85th anniversary. So those of you in the audience who are here to receive this, please come forward. All of you, yes. I know it is, but it's a good piece of the team. San Angelo Federal Credit Union, established in 1939, was founded with the mission of promoting thrift among its members by providing opportunities to accumulate savings and access credit for provident and productive purposes. purposes. As the oldest federal credit union in the area, the institution is dedicated to delivering exceptional member service daily. Individuals residing, working, worshiping, or attending school in Tom Green County or having a relative who is a member are eligible for membership at San Angelo Federal Credit Union. The credit union takes pride in being a full-service financial institution, continually evaluating the latest technology to offer members the most advanced products and services. For 85 years, San Angelo Federal Credit Union has stood as a pillar of strength, stability, and service. Throughout this time, the institution has provided valuable financial resources and support to over 4,000 members. San Angelo Federal Credit Union remains steadfast in its commitment to empowering members to achieve their financial goals and dreams, enriching lives for decades. Therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, 
Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim February 10, 2024, as San Angelo Federal Credit Union's 85th anniversary and invite all members to participate in commemorating this significant milestone by attending their annual membership meeting on March 21st, 2024. Congratulations on 85 years. Thank you. Would you like Thank to you. Yes. offer some comments? Sure. Thank you so much for this honor and recognizing our 85th anniversary. We are blessed and proud to be the oldest federal credit union here in San Angelo. <clears throat> Pardon me. As the oldest federal credit union, we were established originally to serve the city and county employees. So sometimes I think maybe we're the best kept secret that people still think that. Um, but in 2006, we did open up to the community. So if you are a resident in Tom Green County, we would love to let you be our member. When you're a member, you're an owner, and we would love to help you meet any of your financial needs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would you like to take off or anything? Okay. Then let's go have the picture. Come on yeah. to the front. Our next proclamation is Texas Small Business Development Center Day, and I know we have people in the audience for this, so please come forward. Good, good. Yeah, yeah, you tall people in the front. <laughs> Small businesses are the backbone of our economy, contributing significantly to job creation, innovation, and community vitality, which is why the National Small Business Development Center, or SBDC, program was legislated via the Small Business Act of 1976 as a program of the U.S. Small Business Administration. SBDCs play a, a crucial role in supporting the growth and success of small businesses across the nation by providing expert guidance, resources, and training to entrepreneurs and small business owners. Since 1990, the Angelo State University Small Business Development Center has been instrumental in empowering small businesses in our community by offering no-cost consulting services and training workshops. With a mission to foster small business success, the ASU SBDC strives to educate and, and assist entrepreneurs in various areas of business development, including access to capital, market research, research assistance, and human resource management. The SBDC has demonstrated unwavering dedication to fostering economic development and the entrepreneurial spirit within the city of San Angelo. Contrib contributing to the resilience and prosperity of our local business ecosystem with over $9.2 in capital infusion from SBDC clients. Therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim March 20, 2024, as Texas Small Business Development Center Day in San Angelo, Texas, and call this observance to honor their contributions and celebrate their achievements. Congratulations. Would you like to speak? I'm going to give you the proclamation. If you offer some words. Thank you. I would just like to thank everybody for their support and their time today, especially our host, Angelo State University, um, our economic development partners that help us serve the small businesses of San Angelo and all that they do in the various areas of economic growth. And then most importantly, I want to thank my team. We have here uh, with us our student team, uh, Julia, Sunby, and Zhang. They are part of the Norris Vincent College of Business and assist us in our day-to-day as well as supporting clients as well under the tutelage of our professional advising team, which is Miss Elizabeth Dantzler, Angelina Osorno-Torres, James Lavelle, 
And very special returnee, Dave Erickson. He couldn't stay away. I'm, I appreciate his mentorship and, and am excited to have him back on the advising roster to continue to support small businesses. And like the mayor mentioned, it's our goal to be here to serve the small businesses in San Angelo. And that's anybody that's 500 or fewer employees. So if you are a business here in the Concho Valley or in our surrounding 10 county area, we're here to support you in whatever opportunities or hurdles that you face. So thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council. Our next proclamation is for the Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. Do I have individuals in the audience to come forward for this? Good. Hi, Greg. How are you? Good to see you. Got the crew today. Good. <laughs> they don't want to stand next to me. <laughs> March 2024 marks the 37th anniversary of National Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. The Disabilities Assistance and Bill of Rights Act of 2000, DD Act, ensures that individuals with developmental disabilities and their families can access community services, personalized support, and assistance to promote self-determination, independence, productivity, and community integration and inclusion. National Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month serves as a platform to celebrate the contributions of individuals with livid experience across Texas and the Concho Valley while raising awareness about the barriers they encounter in achieving complete community inclusion. Nationally, approximately 57 million people have a disability, with around 3.5 million in Texas having a developmental disability and approximately 475,000 having an intellectual and developmental disability. Texas residents, both with and without developmental disabilities, greatly enrich the communities of Texas and the Concho Valley through their strengths, abilities, and contributions. While celebrating a brighter future and expanded opportunities, it is crucial to acknowledge the existing obstacles that hinder individuals with developmental disabilities from realizing their full potential in various aspects of life, such as school, work, home, or as members of their families and communities. Therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim March 2024 as Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month and encourages everyone to learn about how systematic barriers still exist that limit people with disabilities from enjoying equitable experiences and living independent, productive lives within their communities. Thank you, Greg. May you accept this? And may I have some more? Well, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, City Council. You know, MHMR, we can't do what we do without our partners, our sponsoring agencies like the City Council, uh, and we, we greatly appreciate your support. Um, I have brought, as usual, this annually, I bring our basketball team, I bring our cheerleaders, some of them, and I like to recognize them because they're the ones who work so hard and make this month one of the, the best celebrations we have at MHMR. Um, I also have our coach, Rita, over here, She's the tallest basketball coach I think, I've, I think I've ever met. She dedicates hours upon hours every year coaching folks in not only basketball, but flag football, badminton, bowling, track, 
unbelievable amount of time. This is our 20th anniversary going up to Big Spring, Howard College. We play other teams. We play uh, Abilene, Midland, Odessa, Big Spring, Sweetwater, some of the other communities. And it's a huge tournament. It's an awesome time to celebrate people with not disabilities, but abilities. And um, I, I'm really proud of our team, our services, and what we do here in the community, how we enhance lives for others. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now move into the public comment section of the agenda. If you choose to speak, please come forward and state your name and address or SMD area. Each citizen can speak just once per item unless asked to comment by council. <laughs> public comment is for three minutes unless extended by council or translation services. The proponent or opponent, five minutes unless extended by council or translation services. Council has no obligation to respond to comments or questions from the public. Any response from a member of the City Council to non-agenda comments is limited to, one, a statement of specific factual information, two, recitation of existing policy, and three, directing staff to place a subject on a future agenda. Do we have people in our audience? Yes, good Talk morning. Public comment, welcome. Well, um, <laughs> Sylvia Martinez, 827, uh, 818 San Jacinto. I'm, I came today because um, as I'm supposed to be a, a businesswoman, but um, because of um, the circumstances, they never uh, let me open because of my parking. Um, uh, I knew that uh, because of that, I, I let it go, I just let it go, but I went to go pay my taxes, and I was, I'm kind of upset because I feel that they should uh, let me, uh, I went and paid them. The young girl that was the cashier told me, you do not have no say toward the building. I, I was upset because all these years, the city has not let me do nothing. Last year, it almost got burned down, okay? I live with it. I have lived all these years. I turned 70 this year. I'm gonna be 71 in August. And I lived. Now, we're, we're gonna take our, they might take our rights away. I've, I've ta you all have taken all of this from me, not letting me open. If I was downtown, I bet you, because I don't have parking, you all would have let me open. Now, these people don't want me to have a say-so toward my building, that I paid $2,000, but they took my money. And I'm just here so people out there can hear what the city of San Angelo is doing to us. You take my rights as a businesswoman. You're a businesswoman. How would you like if they did it to you, Mayor? I'm here as a businesswoman first, and then a woman. I wouldn't have to live like I live right now if you all would let me open. Look at those people in Sonora. They have buildings, but they're opening. For what? For taxes. But no, you all can't let this Mexican woman open because she don't have parking. But you all live with it every day. 
I pray that one of these days before I die, y'all have the decency to tell me, Ms. Martinez, you're a businesswoman, you can open. And I'll leave it at that. Further public comment? Second to get set up here. Yeah, I don't know if the timer is working. I noticed. I don't know if it is or not, working. and I didn't bring my manual one. I assume it is, because y'all are going to cut me off at three minutes, I know. Well, I just didn't see the lights well, going I, yeah. on or off. I'm here, I was so. assuming it does, and you're. I realize I've tried to be very careful. But, okay, and, as, and I'm doing some pictures this time, which I've not done before, so I'm a little less organized. So you, maybe you could bear a second or two as I get, get it together to do all this at the same time. Okay. <clears throat> my name is Jackie Chestnut. I'm a woman. As a woman, I have worn many hats over 67 years. This is International Women's Month, which we haven't recognized yet. We all get a month and a week and a day, and we, 50% of the population, are going to get this month to speak. So, I am an engineer. I'm a rancher. I'm a patent holder of an invention of a round bell hay feeder. I have been arrested twice illegally. I've got a spouse that was taken into this city and murdered, um, and I have been through the hell of that. I have now recovered from that, not financially, but I have. I've been robbed, and many other things. So I've got many, many hats I've worn now, not, some of them not too happy to have worn. So now, in 2020, this government uh, decided to shut us down, which was illegal, and you all acted like you were the parents that could send us all home, and the whole thing was illegal. So since then, I consider y'all hostile, and I don't approve what y'all do. So um, in 2020 is when it led to the atrocity that occurred to me over the past four years. So and I'll, I'll go from there. Joe Hyde said, nobody likes me. Don't really care, Joe. Okay. Um, next, we're going to lead into the topic of some specific things about the city that I want to talk about. We have a big problem in this city with sewer gas. Every facility you go into from City Hall to uh, the courthouses to every place you go, and I've been in all these places now over the past three years with the atrocities that have occurred to me, we have sewer gas regularly. Now, as an engineer, I'm, I'm tasked with not having sewer gas in facilities. That's one of my biggest jobs. So I'm going to hand over to you all the regulations on sewer gas and, and leads to the fact that we need to do some serious, serious things in this town relating to sewer. We know we have water issues, big ones with sewer, because this is deadly gas. It will kill you. I don't like breathing it. I don't want to breathe it. I don't want to walk into a facility in the city and breathe it. So I'm going to hand that to you all and let you all study that. Next thing is, all over this town, in many, many, many of the houses around here, we still have Federal Pacific Electric Panels which will burn your house down, and they do regularly. They happen to have caught the house on fire in the ranch that I live in out in Knickerbocker because it was a house that was moved out from Houston Art Freeway, and they told, the, told everybody these were supposed to be out of our homes, and we are selling homes all day long in this city. Two people, I have three friends that were sold homes with these in them. They were told they were illegal, and they sold them the homes anyway, and they're living in them, and now they've got electrical problems, and they're about to burn their houses down. Y'all need to do some studying now. Next thing is, I got nine seconds. Let's look at a, look at the pretty picture right here that I bring up of our facilities in San Angelo, Texas. This is our railroad depot that we remodeled and did, and I just want you to take a look at it, and you we'll go from there. Up. Thank okay? you. And then we'll bring some more pictures, and I've got 300 because I'm going to ask for an agenda item because I want this as an agenda item because I want to do a whole presentation on condition, and I'll shut up because that's what you want me to do. Okay. Thank you. And I don't. I'm not pleased to be here at all. This is, this is like going to chemotherapy, which I've been to. I've never seen people so unbelievable. Yeah, look at that. You want to go sit in that seat? Go take a look at it. Further public comment?
Everybody see me because I'm, you know, little. Uh, my name is, I'm lovingly referred to around town as Cat the Repo Chick. I work for Texas Truck World and do asset recovery. My name is Katrina Feuerstein. Recently, we inflated a gorilla for advertising purposes. And the day we got it, we inflated it just to see how big it was going to be. Our intention is to put it as a permanent structure on top of our building, which we were told, I, or I was told by code compliance, would be then advertising for the business as signage and everything was fine. We received a citation, not even a warning, and we were told that it was distraction to drivers. So it was every billboard that's up in the town, and one that really gets me is the ones that say, we heard you, don't text and drive, or something with the cow. So you don't want people to text and drive, but you want them to pay attention long enough to read a billboard, and that's distracted driving. I mean, come on. We were just testing it out. It could have been a warning and not a citation. And all day long, I see inflatable bouncy houses at businesses, and I've spoken to them. They have never re received a citation or a warning. Those wiggly little men that you see, nobody's ever received just a warning or a citation because the code says, the code compliance says, anything inflatable has to be 20 inches or under. That's not even two foot. And as I stated, there's plenty of businesses in this town that have inflatables and they've never been cited. So I would like the code compliance looked at and changed and perhaps granted a permit, we'll pay for it. Great, we don't mind that, pay for a permit. But just cut us some slack. We do generate a lot of business, a lot of jobs in the, in the city, the county, and plenty of other counties in the surrounding area. We sell over 100 cars a month, and that's unheard of for a used car dealership. So, you know, just like a little consideration, like the code compliance looked at, and would like some immediate feedback on whether we can get a permit to put that on top of our building as advertisement. Thank you. Further public comment? At a January, oh, Zane White, District 6. At a January 26, 2023 DHRC meeting, Lee Fluger submitted his proposed Cactus Hotel metal canopy replacement and storefront repainting project for DHRC approval in order to subsequently be eligible for a $75,000 taxpayer-funded tiers grant. Since only awnings and not canopies existed at the Cactus Hotel, Bluger's DHRC application should have been automatically considered invalid. Based upon Federal Secretary of the Interior Historic Restoration Standards, which were formally adopted in 2022 by the Cosa City Council, DHRC Chairman David Mazur expressed specific concerns that metal awnings might not possibly not qualify as historically authentic replacements for the original fabric awnings. COSA Principal Planner Sherry Bailey misleadingly stated the following to Chairman Mazur. Looking at the city's historic preservation design guidelines, metal canopies can be considered. It is in the Interior Secretary's design elements if they maintain a similar look and color to the existing cloth canopies, end quote. It's a fact that federal historic restoration standards indicate that such replacement is not permissible within the downtown historic overlay zone. However, based upon the misleading official information presented to them by Shirley Bailey, DHRC commissioners quickly approved Pfluger's corrupted, illegitimate project proposal. Pfluger's DHRC project approval was then next addressed at a January 23rd, 2024 tiers board meeting where the tiers application somehow now included two non-DHRC approved items, door unit replacements and installation of ADA entry systems. Erroneously believing that DHRC had legitimately approved Pfluger's project proposal, tiers board members approved Pfluger's grant.
at the February 20th, 2024 City Council meeting, Council Member Karen Hesse Smith requested a detailed review regarding the facts I had presented. Mayor Gunner expressed a critical importance of honoring historical restoration standards and an approval motion regarding Pfluger's Tears Grant funding was tabled. At a March 5th, 2024 Council meeting with Mayor Gunner and Karen Hesse Smith not present, the remaining five council members completely disregarded my evidence and swiftly authorized Pfluger's $75,000 TEARS grant funding. The DHRC board should immediately be directed to review Pfluger's latest fraudulent TEARS grant application prior to any TEARS and city council approvals. Lastly, I wanted on the record that I was recently told by Assistant City Attorney Rick Weiss that there are no options whatsoever for appealing the illegitimate tears funding authorization to Pfluger. Thank you. Right, Rick? Not the Assistant City Attorney. Further public comment? With no further public comment, we will move into the uh, consent agenda portion of today's meeting. I will start with Larry. Do you have an item you'd like to pull from consent agenda? No, ma'am. Karen? No, ma'am. Lucy? No, ma'am. Harry? No, ma'am. Tom? No, ma'am. Tommy? No, ma'am. With that, we, I will ask for a motion for approval on items A through F on the consent agenda. May I have that motion? So moved. So moved by Second. Larry and seconded, I believe, by Tom. Any public comment on the consent agenda items? Seeing none, we will take a vote. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Hearing no nays. We will approve the consent agenda, all items. We will now move into our regular agenda. Comments regarding items on the regular agenda may be made by the public when each item is discussed as outlined above. Applicants, proponents, and appellants are exempt from the time limit above and instead must limit their remarks to less than five minutes. The first item on the agenda is A, Keep San Angelo Beautiful Annual Report for 2023. And Charlotte Anderson is here to present. Charlotte Anderson, Executive Director of Keep San Angelo Beautiful. Good morning, Mayor Gunter and City Council. It's great to be with you today. Um, so again, uh, we want to thank you all for the opportunity to review our annual report and um, provide you an overview of our activities and events for the past year. One project we've been working on, which we completed successfully, I'm very excited are our signs that show we are a Keep Texas Beautiful affiliate. And TxDOT installed four of those in our gateway areas. We're really proud of them. As you're coming in, 87 from the south, um, you'll see it on the right. 87 from the north. We also have two signs coming in 67 from the north and then headed out 67 west out by Sam's Club. So we hope you take a look at that and we hope we can remind our citizens that in San Angelo we don't litter. Well, we should tell everybody that, that <laughs> as they drive on Houston Heart and Loop 306 that we don't litter. <laughs> that would be nice if they all knew. Maybe we need to buy a few more signs. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little trash. Here we go. Uh, for the year, um, we did 15 cleanups, 51,000 pounds of trash and hazardous waste. Again, um, for our four years, we're starting our fifth year, 46 cleanups, and we've removed over 156,455 58 pounds of trash. So here, 
hopefully, um, again, we send that message that real Texans don't litter. We've got about 200 volunteers at our Texas trash shop, 587 volunteers on our fall sweep. So we do have an upcoming Don't Mess With Texas Trash Off April 6th. So if you don't have anything to do, we hope you'll join us. Okay. Now we're going to do a little rolling and stacking. According to TxDOT, tire debris is one of our largest on our highways. We're excited to report we've removed right at 25,225 tires in our community over the past three years. Said it before, say it again. You haven't lived until you've rolled and stack. Um, I want to uh, send out a special thank you to Harry for his challenge and inspiration for our work with the tires. Um, he's been at every single event, and he's rolled and stacked just like the rest of us. So these tires are taken from our community. They go to Burnett, Texas, where they're chipped into one-inch squares. The metals are removed and sent to a steel foundry where they are turned into rebar and angle iron products. And then the one inch squares are used for tire derived fuel, um, most predominantly in the Texas area. So our hazardous waste team. Could you go back to that slide? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so it says, uh, Oops, no. Wrong way. Here we go. Here we go. So it says $2 donation per tire. Do we. Uh, ask for that or do we just have a sign that requests that I mean that's a lot of work and effort and a lot of tires mm -hmm. so what are we doing and how are people reacting to the two dollar donation per tire so typically in the past we did not charge anything or have a suggested donation um, we've had an overwhelming response and um it is quite a challenge depending on how many volunteers you have. So we thought with the $2 donation, maybe that would help curb that a little bit. Um, but from our last event, not necessarily so. Um, we see our, our community and our citizens definitely donating and making a huge impact. Um, we just want the entirety of the community that comes out to bring their tires, especially those that may have 50 tires, may have 100 tires, may go back and get another load of tires. You know, we don't... Are these businesses or individuals? Because I would assume that if you're a business and you take tires off or tires part of your business, right. that they would be responsible for their own tire disposal, not keep San Angelo beautiful in the city of San Angelo. It's one thing if you're an individual. It's another if you're a business. Right. And... Uh, what we're doing this year to curb that, I would say 99% of the time, the people that come up are not in a vehicle that's identified as a business. So, you know, you kind of just don't know. You just see a lot of people with a lot of tires, and then you tell the person who's executing the event, send that truck over there, <laughs> not to our truck. <laughs> but um, we, we do try very hard to accommodate everybody that comes to our events. Um, this upcoming event that we will have on September the 7th, we are limiting it to 25 tires per person. That, oh my. Yes, the average individual who's got tires in their garage or maybe in the yard or um, someone may have dumped some tires in their, um, on their ranch property, um, sometimes our, um, our storage but, units. Oh, do we allow people in the county to also bring their tires? Yes, ma'am, we do. Yes, ma'am, we do. We get a little county funding, so we, we want to help as many people as we can. And I try to get as many trucks as possible. Our last event, we keep thinking we're making a dent, we're making a dent. We typically have four trucks at every event, and we only got three trucks. Um, the last week, we got a lot of phone activity, so I went ahead, we added an extra truck. So one truck will hold 800 to 1,200 tires. So with four trucks, one, two, three, four, you know, a potential of over 4,000 tires. Um, this event was um, heavily attended. Um, we had several people that um, were not serviced at the event. We did take their names and numbers and assured them we would have trucks on Monday and Tuesday, and we did. We got two more vehicles in, 18-wheelers again, that hold up to 1,200 tires, and we were able to service about 45 to 50 of those people came back and brought their tires um, to be disposed of. So we're doing everything we can. Um, again, 
Um, the citizens are a priority and we're going to make sure that their tires are taken away. Um, our events start about, uh, we have event check-in at 7.30. Um, try not to kill our vi volunteers too much because we want them to participate. I can tell you I'm there at 5 o'clock in the morning and there are people already in line at 5 o'clock in the morning. And I think that's where our challenge is because if they're already in line so early, then the people that come later at the event are not going to get served because we're going to run out of room. And we do really try hard to have that backup truck for every single event. So we'll plan better. Um, and, and again, um, we are very happy with the results and we are making an impact in the community and we'll continue to do that. The good news, bad news. <laughs> That's right. And it's going to be an ongoing problem. Um, it, it, it's just, um, you know, p part of communities. People have tires, and they have to find a way to get rid of the tires. And hopefully um, our businesses will, will use the prudent method and pay for disposal because they are paying for removing the tires. So. Hazardous waste. Um, had a fantastic event. Um, 59 volunteers, 28 organizations, 287 hours, about $9,000 in value to our citizens. Um, fun fact, um, the providers for this event provide their services for free, except for our hazardous waste disposal unit that comes from San Antonio. So uh, bus recycling comes in for free, secure documents comes in for free. Um, our um, partners take electronics, and we are not paying them with our funds for that. Alliant Recovery takes the oil for free. Um, Safe Harbors comes from San Antonio, and we pay them. So they get 90% uh, of the funding for this event, and it is very costly. But we're very grateful for our local partners. Um, Big Country Recycling, again, uh, they're very generous of their time. Um, and, and come out to service our community and the volunteers as well. They're just amazing. 3,000 pounds of oil, 2,000 on the shredded documents, 150 pounds of cardboard, 2,500 pounds of electronic waste, 10,491 pounds of hazardous waste chemicals and paints. Typically, we're removing about 85% 85, 85 of paints from the community. We have a great art community. Um, and then 3,100 plastic bags are removed, and they are sent to Mertzen. We have a group of ladies called the Prayer Shawl Group, and they take these plastic bags, and they sh shred them into strips and interweave them and make a ball of yarn, and they knit. And what comes out of that is this blanket right here that's made of plastic bags. So the gray are the Walmart bags and the red and white are the HEB bags. And these are um, handed out twice a year to our homeless community. And they look like a rug, but it's a, it's a plastic mat. And they're very durable, um, they're washable, so they are reusable. Uh, this year, we did do 500 trees in the community. About 130 went to our schools, and the rest went to San Angelo. Uh, we've done 950 trees over our four years and are really proud of um, enhancing our school campuses so our students will have habitats, shade, and fresher air. We also recognized our SAISD partners at the end of year last year with a case of coffee so they could finish the year strong. So the coffee that they drank is the only coffee in San Angelo that changes the landscape. And we went to the Star Spangled Celebration. Cash here, who's the president of our Youth Advisory Council, um, is featured. We handed out about 2,000 hand fans and probably just as many trash bags for our citizens to help that cleanup effort at the end of the event. We also celebrate here with Miss Ella Elkins, who saves the oceans. Again, um, she's collected over 30,000 plastic bags at all of our events. She also collected over 5 
hundred pounds of plastic. Um, it was about 820 pounds total, and she was awarded a net Trex recycled bench, which was placed in her elementary at Fort Concho. Um, trees here, just beautiful trees. The community was very excited about that. Just remind everybody that San Angelo gives this May 7th. We have 250 nonprofits that are vying for your contribution, so make a plan and give generously. Okay, education. This is just absolutely fantastic. Um, we were able to meet with our honor students at Angel State University. So our education reach is far and wide. Um, the students at the top are celebrating their book that we published with a book signing event. Um, just incredible. Uh, rolled out the red carpet for them, and they were so pleased. Um, here's Cash again, working on his Trias Research Institute project, where he learned how to put together his own cleanup crew, which he did bring to the next cleanup event. There were 18 on his team. We also worked with Blackshear Heights back to school and handed out about 500 backpacks for kids and did a San Angelo Reads. Awareness. So don't mess with Texas and water wisely messages to our community. Um, help us to keep top of mind awareness that we don't litter in San Angelo. We're proud sponsor of KLSD Coffee Talk on Wednesday mornings and are grateful for our partnership with KLSD and Dakota Coffee on that. We hosted a board retreat this past year and Harry says it was the best ever. So thank you for that. Um, we like our, our board to be up to date and given the best information and have a time to collaborate with each other in, in, in a little bit of a um, beautiful setting. We had a great opportunity to reach out to our ASU basketball team um, with a request from um, Coach George. So we we did contact their coach and ask them to help us remove some paint. Uh, and it was a great lesson um, from Coach George and a great lesson for our basketball students as he gave us the clues to a long and prosperous life. Any guesses? Discipline was his number one key. Um, so it was great to be with him and enjoy that time. Harry Council, Harry, Councilman Harry Thomas, <laughs> with our young leaders. Uh, we're grateful for all of our proclamations, Mayor Gunter, um, and the opportunity to share with our students uh, a civic lesson. And beautification. So these are what the balls of yarn look like. Here's the lady cutting the strips um, from the prayer shawl group. They meet every Wednesday in Mertzen. I got to spend an afternoon with them. Incredible women doing really great things. Um, we did two art murals this year with Art and Uncommon Places, and we're very proud of the collaboration with them. Um, the first one is Rio uh, that's on the River Corridor, and they're just absolutely spectacular. The second one is Recycle of Nature, and if you're ever on the river, if you go by any of these murals, you can um, um, click on the QR code, download the app, iJack app, and it'll pull up uh, the process which electrifies the murals, and it's really quite spectacular. And then, of course, our students with our recycling. Um, we sure appreciate uh, the Christian Academy coming out and being a part of that proclamation. Okay, and a few of our highlights. First, I would like to thank Mayor Gunter, um, City uh, City. Council Manager, <laughs> sorry, uh, Valenzuela, thank you all and Harry for coming out and meeting regarding our awards with TCEQ. We're just very grateful for your time and um, appreciate that so much. So um, we did win the 2024 Texas Environmental Excellence Award for Community and Civic regarding our Tires to Go project. We also won the State of Texas Alliance for Recycling Texas Environmental Leadership Award for extraordinary recycling event for the tires and outstanding public outreach. Um, with Keep Texas Beautiful, we are a Gold Star affiliate for four years now. We've received the Governor's Community Achievement Award of Sustainable Excellence for four years. Um, and then this year, we also received the Keep Texas Beautiful, Beautify Texas Award for Public Education and Outreach, KTB HEB Green Bag winner, four years, 
and a recycling winner for 2023, which assisted with those murals. So great partnerships. We're also a judge for the Governor's Community Achievement Award. Um, that gives us insight to other communities submissions and is the best training we've ever been to. Hopefully we'll see some fruits from that maybe this year. Um, also Keep Texas Beautiful Conference, webinar, mentor, Apache Tree Grant we've received every year. Uh, and again, um, the Tucker Foundation matched that grant so we could give away more trees this year. We'll also be working with our A&M AgriLife partners for their spring symposium that will be at the 4-H Center, and they're going to have a demonstration on how to plant a tree, and every person at that event will receive a tree. Um, Who donates the trees? Uh, we get those from uh, Tree Life Farms out of Houston. They're kind of in Angleton. So uh, the Apache Corporation does the donation of 200 the um, Tucker Foundation, we apply to them every year. We give them three or four options, and depending on what they pick is where we use the resources, and they selected the trees. So that was able to uh, enhance our purchase of double the amount of trees that we received this year. So you don't purchase them. They're granted to you. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Um, so let's go to um, publication, San Angelo Lifestyles, Texas Town and City, Tires to Go, 22, Beauty in the Book um, was in the August edition of 2023. We're real proud of that. Um, we received recognition from TxDOT, and they granted us a Don't Mess with Texas Barrel. They're very costly, and we're just really proud to have that. The kids love it and love taking pictures with it. And we did publish our book, ABC, 26 Ways to Keep San Angelo Beautiful. And with our sponsorship of HEB, we were able to initiate initiate a youth advisory council this year. So very proud of that. And last but not least, we want to talk a little bit about gratitude. So in closing, we participated, joined, and hosted over 220 events last year with over 1,000 volunteers, 4,085 businesses, 3,496 hours with $112, $381,000 value to the city in waste, removal, education, and beautification. We want to thank the city of San Angelo for the opportunity to be a conduit to the community and for supporting safe environmental activities to engage our families, our students, and citizens. In addition to fostering a love of the environment, we are building better businesses and communities through relevant community needs, with intentional acts of service and purposeful team building. We too share the joy of our volunteers and let them know they're always wanted, needed, and valued, and we're grateful for all those who serve to keep San Angelo beautiful. We think you would agree that San Angelo is a remarkable community worth preserving and safeguarding where citizens and nature can coexist in harmony and champion the sustainability of the environment. And not just for today, but we're planting the seeds for our future with our amazing students. So please like, follow, and share to stay up with all our activities and events. Again, our Don't Mess With Texas Trash Off is April 6th. May 7th, San Angelo Gives. Our hazardous waste this year will be June 15th. We will have a presentation by Dr. Alper, who is the Kenneth A. Kobe Professor in Chemical Engineering and Executive Director of the Center for Biomedical Research Support at the University of Austin. His most recent efforts include development of enzymes and microbial processes for reversing or stopping damage of plastic waste and other waste carbon sources. The man is incredible, and it will be a phenomenal presentation. Um, that will be August 23rd, and we'll make sure you get more information on that. Um, September 7th will be Tires to Go, and our fall sweep will be October the 12th. I'm going to put a challenge out to you all, and that is to get start with $5 a vehicle on your tire it's one thing to say $2 a tire. I think we can charge, we can ask for a $5 donation per vehicle. I will reprint that sign immediately. <laughs> okay, I, I think it proves that they need this service. I think the efforts that you all have put together and have done to help improve the quality of life in San Angelo is, is worth $5 a vehicle to get rid of their tires. Thank you.
Mayor Mami. Yes. So, um, and thank you for the invitation last week, Charlotte, to go interview. But before I interviewed, I did a lot of research, and I actually researched other communities to see what they were up to. What you are doing is impressive. Uh, in talking to the TCEQ representatives that were here for that interview, they had mentioned to me as well that uh, there's a lot of communities looking at San Angelo as that example. And you're doing it right. You're doing a wonderful job. And I just want to make sure that I express that to you. Keep up the great work. Uh, you're doing an outstanding job. It keeps San Angelo beautiful and the volunteers. It's an incredible thing that you're doing. Just keep up the great work. Well, thank you. And we appreciate that. Mayor. Other comments from, yes, Harry. I want to say thanks to Charlotte also, uh, but I also want, want to say thanks to the to the board um, and the volunteers that, that Charlotte has, has gathered for these events. Um, I know getting up in the back of those trucks and stacking those tires is not easy, and this old man can't do that anymore, but I can still get him off the trailer. So uh, I will tell you, some of those young people are impressive for the way they, they get up there and do that. Uh, what we've done in, in the four or five years that you've been leading this organization is, is tremendous. Uh, there are many communities that have more mature, um, keep beautiful uh, organizations in their cities that are not where we are today. Uh, Hopefully that doesn't mean we have more trash than other cities. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I can, t I can tell you for a fact there are a lot of people in this community that want to see uh, these events go on because there is... In West Texas, we know that wind blows a lot, and there just happens to be trash in a lot of places. But we do a good job. But I want to say thanks. Uh, we've come a long ways in, in a short period of time. Thank you. Any Harry. other comments? Yes, ma'am. Uh, let's talk trees. Trees. Yeah. Well, as you know, the, the city is uh, concerned and has taken actions on preserving the trees that we do have mm -hmm. in the face of a horrible drought. My question is, the trees that you're planting, are they Texas hardy? Yes, they are. Um, they're all for our region. So we do red oaks, live oaks, pistache. We work very closely with um, our horticulture specialists um, with A&M AgriLife. We work very closely with um, Carl White's team in Parks and Rec. And we also donate a portion of our trees so they can grow a little bit stronger before they are put in the ground. So we typically are going to get a five-gallon tree. Um, the live oaks may come out about four foot tall, but the red oaks are at least six feet tall, um, maybe about um, an inch on the trunk, um, but they're beautiful, thriving trees. Um, and of course, you know, we're, we're going to get shade, fresh air, just um, uh, beautiful for our city. So we're going to continue to make a focus on that. Our board is um, very, very um, insistent that we do trees every single year. So we'll continue to apply for that grant, and hopefully we can continue um, to recruit some matching funds for that as well so we can distribute more trees. But really, really proud that we got to do as many as we did this year. So um, 500 at that event. We'll also do another 100 with A&M AgriLife, and we'll post some information about the spring symposium. I think it's $30 to attend, which is nominal. You're going to leave with a tree, <laughs> you know, and um, a lot of information about um, your yard um, plantings this time of year in the spring, um, fertilizing. It's just a great information session, and we're just really happy to be a part of that. Is there any accommodations for continued care of these trees? Um, I know with SAISD, the maintenance team plants the trees on the campus, and they do put them near a water source. I think um, once their roots uh, are, are stabilized and grow in a little further, um, that they'll take less water um, than what it takes initially, maybe the first um, four, six, eight months. Um, I, I would like to think anybody that gets up at 7 or 8 and waits in a line maybe for an hour for a tree um, would be invested in taking good care of that tree and seeing it grow. They're, they're already beautiful as they are, so um, we hope that that's the case. Thank you. <coughs> Other comments? Or? All right, thank Mayor, you, Charlotte. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, Lucy. Oh, it's okay. I just wanted to say thank you. 
Thank you so much for keeping San Angelo beautiful. Oh, it's a pleasure every day. And thank you all. Thank you for your support. And um, thank you for making it a great day to keep San Angelo beautiful. We'll move on to item B, second reading of an ordinance for Z23-21, a request to expand the open structure overlay map to include the following area of Angelo Heights neighborhood, the 1,000, 3,000, and 4,000 blocks of Catalina Drive, 2,000 and 3,000 blocks of Nueces Drive, 1,000 block of Louise Drive, 1,000 block of Cordell Drive, 2,700 block of Eunice Drive, and the 2,700 hundred block of Erline Drive. And Aaron, you are on. Thank you, Mayor, City Council, and Mr. Valenzuela. Aaron Vinoy, Director of Planning and Development Services. So this is our second reading of our open structure map extension into that area in Angelo Heights. Uh, we did uh, want to bring it back for the public to hear again, as well as any answer any questions that you guys may have. Uh, so I've got uh, some more on our, our presentation. Um, of course, this is the area in Angelo Heights. It's kind of a, what I would call a cul-de-sac neighborhood. It's just at the end. There really aren't, the only way you come out is coming back to Edmond or 29th Street uh, to get back to town. Very nice neighborhood, uh, very nice amenities, very close with Kirby Park and things like that. I think it was very well thought out when it was placed in back in the uh, 60s uh, and houses have been developing all the way into the early 2000s. So I think it's a great neighborhood. Uh, it's in Tom Thompson's area. Uh, again, Angelo Heights. So again, this is that neighborhood. Um, this is just a, an older slide. We have gone back and looked at these um, very specifically uh, to see. Uh, we've asked for a deep dive with permitting uh, and with planning to see if we had any of these that we were just uh, looking at open structures, which uh, for the most common folks call those carports maybe porches. In this case, most of them are carports, but we call them open structures. So I want to get that. But there's a couple of properties on here that we have determined that actually have permits, went through the process, and have gotten everything completed. So they're really, some of these red uh, pins uh, will be actually taken away. Uh, so it's like 1731 Catalina Drive, 2907 Catalina Drive, and 2713 um, uh, Erlene uh, have all gone through the permitting process in the past, and some of them may have gotten a variance from ZBA way back before there was even an open structure overlay back in the late 90s and, and some of those even before. Um, there's also one at 3029 Catalina that also received a permit at the very, very end, one uh, very close to the towards the end of Catalina Drive. Um, so we're very excited that those folks have, as we did our deep dive, we looked at those and said, okay, these guys have done the process, they've done it right. So what does, uh, uh, here's our notifications that we did send out. Again, most of the neighborhood that did respond, and I would say, as you guys see, this is one of the higher response. Now we did send out 231 notices, uh, but to get that many people in support of bringing this overlay to that area is is very telling. Um, so what is the open structure overlay? So this quote up here is just a part of a quote right out of the ordinance, and it's the supporting structure of a carport, show, and it talks about where they are, because open structure overlay allows you to place something in front of the 25-foot standard front yard setback. Now, carports could always be to the side of the house. Carports could always be in the backyard, and there's some zoning rules with those. But these are talking about open structures, carports that are in front of that 25-foot set building setback line. So the, the supporting structure of a carport shall not be located within the minimum front and or side yards except specifically allowed within the open structure overlay. So we're talking those vertical supports. They shouldn't be in front of the 25-foot um, yard setback unless you have the open structure overlay. Well, this neighborhood does not have the open structure overlay, yet we see carports that are in front of that 25-foot setback. So this is kind of step one to allow those carports. Then it's going individually, working with those property owners, how do we get your carport to conform to the standards? Because they still should be five feet back from the front property line, 
they should be at least 10 feet back from the front uh, back of curb. Um, and so those are things we need to work with them. Some of them may be eligible for a zoning board uh, of adjustment variance. Some of them may not. We just have to look at those individually to see what, we're, what we can do there. Now, our section 513, it did allow, it did kind of grandfather, if you will, though some of those carports in that area. And in fact, not just that area, but this is for the entire town. So things that were built before March 8th, 1995, if it meets those six criteria, they're allowed. So that, that's one of the things. Now they're not allowed in the front yard setback, but they're allowed as carports. And so we, we try to look back at the uh, right of way and, and the easement we look at the back of the curb. We ask the building official and their team who have, are the experts of how is this built structurally? Is it sound? Is it substantially open? Uh, we have Charlotte go out and make sure that everything's clear of junk and debris. Now she just became a code enforcement officer. She doesn't want to do that. So we have our code guys that check those things. Uh, and it's an accessory to the principal structure uh, so that it's not the, the main structure on the property. So on the open structure overlay, Open carports and porches shall be allowed to extend into minimum, minimum front and side yards, which otherwise are required to be free of any buildings, subject to the conditions expressed here within this section. So it must be substantially open in character. That means to us in layman's terms, that means no walls. Now it still could be connected to the house and there would be the back wall to the house or the, or the front wall to the house. We're talking about sides in the front. Is it substantially open? Minimum five feet from the front lot boundary and 10 feet from back of curb. Roof nor vert vertical support can encroach in the right of way. That means you don't need to have that overhang or the vertical support in the right of way. That causes problems for our utility installers. Uh, that causes problems for people going in the public right of way. Um, it also says no more than 30% of the front yard can be covered. We rarely see that, we rarely see that request, but it also protects the uniformity of that neighborhood or neighborhoods in the open structure overlay that you're just not building this huge uh, front yard carport that's taking up a lot of the yard. The other things it comes down to, and it's uh, the, the, the words are generally consistent, and that's where there's some interpretation by city staff, by our Zoning Board of Adjustment and those that are looking at these that have to come in for if they need a variance or things like that. Talks about materials and character. Talks about pitch and shape shall be integrated and consistent with the character of the home. And it says, talks about whatever portion of the residence is closest to that open structure, it should match that kind of uh, pitch and shape. It says flat roofs not allowed unless away from street view. And that means really a traditional straight flat roof, one that has no slope, and that's how we've interpreted that in the past, has no slope. It's just a flat, uh, perpendicular to the ground carport. Those should be in the backyard. And you've seen some of those in backyards off alleyways and things like that. So in front yards, we want them to be fairly consistent to the design of the house. Sometimes that can be challenging um, because the design of the house can be very different. There, you could have gable roofs, you could have some hip roofs, you could have different types of roof lines on a house. And so as city staff are trained, as well as working with ZBA is, all right, where does that open structure, that carport or porch connect? Does it make sense? Does it have at least some slope? Does it have a considerable pitch if there's a pitch behind it? Say if there's a gable end behind it, does it kind of match that gable end or is it just a sloped front, um, uh, front carport? So I've got some images, I believe. So here are some ones that we're just kind of looking at that um, we're like, okay, well, potentially, if you look at these roof lines, they're both kind of, um, they are sloping down, they're at a higher pitch, but you can also see that these have a pitch so that water is rolling off. And really, the pitch for roofing is about rolling off water. 
but it's also of when you're in that neighborhood, are things looking fairly consistent? Not that you don't have individuality between each home, but you're looking for some consistency. So these things are things that staff would look at to work with them to see if anything needs to change. More than likely from the carport standpoint, the open structure standpoint, we would probably work very closely with the applicants to, to, to allow these to move forward if they um, needed permits or something of that nature. But here's a couple of others that are um, a little bit different. Uh, obviously, you can see this one's just a little higher. Um, so we'd have to maybe look at maybe a variance for that. Just because it's higher, does that mean it's wrong? We're not sure. We need to talk with them to see uh, what some of the decisions were. How can we work with them to make this blend in maybe? Um, on this side, this is one that's right up at the property line. Again, uh, obviously the owners are trying to protect their property and so we want to respect that but at the same time we also have to respect our right-of-way which is all the folks um, property and so we have to make sure that everyone can utilize that space as needed so we may have to work with this individual a little bit oh, wrong ways excuse me unless those are duplicate slides all right they're duplicates how about that so here we have a couple of them um, that have actually kind of done everything they can to try to mimic the uh, gable end of the house. See, this one is is very similar to those uh, to that. Um, it's built fairly consistently. While it may be offset, it still has that roof line that allows it to be kind of offset. And then you see these two open, um, what I would call the first one is a porch and the other one is kind of a partial carport. I don't know. We didn't really look to see if the car could get all the way under there. But again, they, they're both in the front yard setback. And so these would be considered open structures. Um, we would say the they're very, very consistent. And these, if they needed permits, they would probably just need a permit, would not need to go to ZBA uh, or any other staff interpretation to allow them. And again, here's another one um, that they, they went uh, kind of all out, uh, which actually looks great with the house. I think uh, folks that would drive by it say, well, that looks like it was built when the house was built. It's integral to the house. They have a, a very good um, a way that it's blended in. They brought the shingles over. Uh, and so I think they've, this one's done a very good job. You can see that there's a pretty good significant distance from the curb line as well as whatever the property line would be. So again, this one uh, is, is very conforming to what we would look at. That might be my last image. So with that, uh, we did take this to Planning Commission. It's been a, a fairly long process. Uh, but staff is recommending approval of the open structure overlay map being extended into that neighborhood. And then we are working on, we have a draft of a letter to uh, send to ones that we just need to get more information from those property owners, have a, a talk with them and visit with them of, all right, what can we do as a city staff to help you become compliant? And that's really our goal is the health and safety side of it is to get them to be compliant um, Several of those structures don't have permits. Now, they may be have some documentation, and that's what we're going to ask for. Do you have documentation that you came to us at some point somewhere in the past? We want to work with them. We don't want to come and say, okay, we're, we're, we're wanting to penalize you. We want to help you guys. So, Mayor? Yes, Let me ask Aaron a question. So at that point in 95, where they grandfathered a bunch of those in, it stipulated you need to come in at this point and get a permit if you were existing you were needed to come in and get a permit. You just couldn't be there and just continue to go forward. Correct. Okay. And I think that's where we will have to work with, with uh, property owners um, to work with them. And a lot of it is, uh, is just being honest with us and us being honest with them of trying to work with them. We, we want to help them. We don't want to come and, and penalize them because they have this open structure. We want to just make sure that we're following the right rules. Aaron, one thing to just clarify a little more, and he covered it there, I think, on item number, uh, where do you talk about the building official number three? So one point is that, you know, if these structures don't have a permit, 
they have to still meet minimum building requirements. So basically, just to give a little history, the city years ago did a process where um, if you're building a carport, any structure has to have an engineering stamp on it to show that it's, it meets the building criteria. San Angelo went above and beyond and got some pre-stamped uh, engineering for a carport, which made it easier for people to come in. And we say, you don't have to go to an engineer. Here's a pre-stamped option for you. You can build to this standard and we'll accept it. So a lot of these carports, some of them you saw on the screen today, while they looked nice, the poles may be this big, which do not most likely meet the standard for our construction. So in those scenarios, those people can either bring us an engineered stamped plan that shows that that is compliant and we will accept that. If they can't produce that, then they have to meet that requirement. So San Angelo kind of, I think, goes above and beyond trying to help people have that without having to go get an engineer, but you got to come in and, and get it. So, Tom, you were going to add a more comment. So we had, after the last council on that Tuesday, that following Wednesday, we had, I think it was probably a hour, hour and a half call to discuss this. And it was, you know, there's been a lot of time and effort spent in here. And we, what we've done is we've taken something and made an overlay to make things better. And you can see a lot of people in favor of moving forward with this so they can develop along these guidelines. There are some people that how we're going to go back and look at and say, structurally, are you safe? And if you are, then you move forward, not a problem. But right now, everything's illegal. We need this to move forward, and that way we can turn around and say, you have a probability of moving forward with exactly what you have. All right, so it's, it's the first good step to go through. I know it's been kind of painful for some. I've talked with two or three different people here. One is going to have to make some changes, but they like what they've heard. It gives them a chance to come in and talk. Um, Gary Cortez was there, and there's, you know, ways to come forward with a variance. But, you know, when we look down at it, a lot of people put a lot of time and effort into it to move forward and make all these things legal. And I looked at the process, and uh, I, I'm in, in agreement, strong agreement of what we're moving forward with. But I want you to know that everybody's looked at the people that have something, and there isn't going to be anything discriminatory against somebody for not having a permit. You just come and, like what Rick said, proof it up that it's structurally sound and safe, and you move forward. Well, it seems to me that there's been a lot of work and effort put into this conversation and to the situation. The question I have is, that's a lot of houses. That's a, do we have the staff available to really go through this process as it's lined out here and work through that? Because it seems to me that we already have a staff issue in terms of work that needs to be done. And this looks very time consuming. It looks um, like it could tie the planning. The, uh, it just looks like we could have a long line of people with not enough people to manage the situation. So I just want to make sure if we say, yes, this makes sense. Yes, it allows people to move forward with confidence that we really can do this. So to, to answer that, and I'll let Aaron and Rick correct me if I'm wrong, we, we looked at that. Some of these pins are going to come out because they do have permits. And I think what we're going to boil down to is maybe 10 to 12 people that are going to get a notification. I mean, if, if I have to go talk and meet with them, I talked to uh, Mr. Word and said, hey, here's what it is. Here's going to come forward. We'll probably have a, a notification and try to get all these people together at one time and say, we're going to set aside a time for all of y'all to come forward and, and meet with us and talk and to answer these questions. But I think what we got, there's going to be fewer than what we have, Brent. I want to say we may have. So these are it, the only ones that you think are problematic, except you listed some of them already as they've met the In standard. compliance, yes. That yes, map is not going to, the, the count's not going to get bigger. Yes, ma'am. This map represents everyone that we saw that had an open structure. So that, that's what this map represents here. And we have gone through the research and determined that out of this map, we're able to take four to five of those properties off of there. And so we're really working, like uh, uh, Councilman Thompson said, between eight to ten actual structures that we need to work with. And it also gives a guideline to the rest of the neighborhood. If they want to do a carport in front of their home, they already know what to expect. It puts that expectation out there. It, it allows them to be able to find a path to move forward. 
I, I said, think it, that's a key yeah. word, path to move forward, so that people understand you just can't do it, but here's how right. you do it. Yes. And then I want to make sure when we talk about the word grandfather, that we define what grandfather means. Is it a date, a time of month, it, that from this date, et cetera, that this goes into effect so we don't come back or next council come back a year from today or two years from today in this open structure scenario comes back up and we debate one more time about this March 8th, 1995. I think to clarify, grandfathering is not really an option here. You, you, you come into compliance. This gives them the right to have that there. Nothing is grandfathered. You have to meet the minimum building requirements and you have to get the setback. This just gives them the right to do that, which before they didn't have. I'll also point out that long term, it should help staff a little bit because now this group has the ability to put that carport in. If they meet the minimum requirements and do that, they don't have to go for a variance. They can get a permit and do it. So it lessens long term our number of cases we're taking forward to the Planning Commission. So the key thing is when it says this section allowed carports built before March 8th, 1995 to remain if yes and all of the newspaper articles or whatever that exist when it said grandfathered it didn't list these six criteria that you had to meet in order to quote be grandfathered in i did not see that list in the in the articles um so how would one know but but I if think what was key at that point, Brenda, was in all of those articles it says, now you must come in and get a permit. You just can't sit there and say, oh, I mean, you had to come in and get a permit. At that time, these things would have been disclosed. So I think there was fair disclosure on March 8, 1995 on what you had to be. That's what I want to make sure is that there was. it wasn't just a date and the word grandfathered without language that made people understand what they needed to do or have to do in order to, quote, be grandfathered in. And, and as Councilman Thompson said, the, the key part of that is coming in and getting a permit. Had the ones that we had the complaints on, had they come in to get a permit, we would have been able to walk them through the process. Now, now we're going to have, if we're able to get the open structure overlay, we're going to give them the ability, yes, you can have something there instead of a no, you cannot. Um, this is going to give them an ability to have it, build it structurally sound and to these parameters, and you're able to do that. So also just to clarify that this open structure language that we're discussing today applies to more than just the area we're talking about, but in fact applies to the entire city as it relates to open structure. Well... I just want to clarify what, what you, you clarify. asked, yes. Uh, so if you're in the open structure overlay, and let me come back to maybe this larger map, uh, it's uh, maybe a little difficult to see, but if you're in this pink area, that allows you to build to the open structure overlay standards in the zoning ordinance, which allows you to build in front of that 25 foot setback. If you're not within that open structure overlay, you're outside of that pink area, you should not have a carport or an open structure in front of the 25-foot setback. And all of those structures, whether you're in the pink or outside of that area, then you must get a permit for those types of structures. I just want to make sure we're clear about that. Yes, ma'am. That this overlay is an overlay very specifically to this pink territory. Yes, ma'am. And then we, we are just extending it to this neighborhood right here so that, that they would be allowed to have those open structures. Now their next step is to get them to come get their permits, get them structurally sound, and move forward if anybody else wants to build one in that area. So are we confident that within that pink area that those individuals with carports, open structures currently meet the standard? I will say in any part of our town, there's a, there's a chance that somebody has built something without permits. It keys on that permit. If you come and talk to us, we can get you the right standards. 
Are they built sometimes incorrectly? They could be, and until we have a complaint about that structure, we don't go and drive up and down the streets just for enforcement. We wait until we get a complaint, then we investigate it to see what's going on, to see if we need to just address that property or if this is a bigger situation. In this case, we felt that this was an isolated neighborhood. It was a little bit easier to solve the problem for that entire neighborhood as opposed to just one property here or there. Uh, council, do I have other comments or questions from city council members? Tom, any further comment? No, um, I think we've covered it and we've we've put a lot of time and effort in this with planning the part. There's a lot of people behind the scenes that have really researched it. It's a path to move forward for the best of everybody involved. What I what I do want to say is I want to caution citizens since this has hit the books the past since it was triggered probably a month ago, I've seen two or three posts on social media where construction companies say, we'll come build you a carport. What citizens need to be aware of is you need to have a permit and you need to verify with who you're doing construction. Are you responsible for the permit or, for, or am I? Because I watched a conversation where a contractor was like, no, and they were very vague in that. And then when it finally got to it was, well, somebody's gonna to have to go get a permit, but they tried to avoid that. But with everything that's said here and move forward, I'll make the motion to approve as presented. Second. Second by Lucy. This is now open for public comment. Good morning, Council. Gary Cortese, Chairman of the ZBA Zoning Board of Adjustments. Uh, Tom, I, I appreciate the hard work you've put into this to try to work it out, and I appreciate your last statement about folks getting permits. They need permits. They're, they're building them and then coming and asking for forgiveness after they build them. Small C contractors, I won't even use the word. Um, that's probably taking that word contractor too far. Are telling folks they don't need a permit. And uh, so they get them built at a uh, lesser rate, I guess, less expensive, but they do need a permit. There's a fine process in the, in the code book uh, where the folks can actually get fined for doing this, and that has not been brought up for very good reasons. I'll bring it up. Uh, and it's not being talked about. It's spread around on Facebook, like Tom said, that I'm a contractor or a hustler or whatever that I will uh, come build your carport. You don't need a permit, you don't need, the contractor does not need, doesn't need to be registered with the city. And so here we are, and this is probably not the last time we're gonna see this unless something happens in the word of mouth department amongst the street, the street talk. The street talk is we don't need a permit. Do it, if they catch you, we'll ask, ask for forgiveness, Go on down the road. So forgiveness the comes with a price tag. Forgiveness comes with a price tag. We need to be very clear on that. Yeah, we need to stop Including this. Including it could be torn down. That would start the word on the street. <laughs> so let's be clear. But I know, I, yeah, I'm, yeah, I will. Uh, it's kind of a political hot button there. But uh, if it comes down to the ZBA, uh, in, these illegal carports, I'm probably going to, lean on the fine situation, get attention if possible. And um, uh, so that's my statement on that. The other part of the, uh, what we talked about here is the look of them. I didn't hear any clarity on the look. Uh, do we need to get into that? What I understood and was the examples and the pictures shown were pretty clear that if it was just a flat, structure, flat roof structure didn't match the house that it would be questioned in terms of being legitimate. Now, aesthetically, what one person thinks could be different from what somebody else thinks, and so the question mark, who's in charge of it, the aesthetics in terms of deciding whether it's good, bad, or doesn't work. And that isn't our, my job. So somebody's job 
will have to be to ensure that we're not trying to say pink is good, red is bad. I think on, on that question, a little guidance for staff would be helpful. I think some of those you saw good pictures of where it came off of a, a hip house and, you know, it was just a gradual slope. It was somewhat flat, but it blended with the house. It was generally. You saw another picture where there was a carport that was very flat, but it was up this much higher than the rest of the house. To me, that doesn't try to blend with the house at all, but a direction from y'all that you agree or disagree with that would help. Yeah, I have a real issue with trying to be, and Tom, I need you to have a voice in this. What's your opinion? The majority of this started with triggered with a complaint on one that, that came in. There are several of them out there, and they're generally, I'm going to steal this word from Tommy in a discussion, but they were generally consistent with what's in the neighborhood. Um, Carl Word, who has one, he has the, the flatter roof one, but it has the slope. Structurally, he's going to have to make some changes to it. Um, I think the, the point where I went to at this, at this point was structurally safe. All right, we're talking less than eight of them. All right, the, the couple I saw with flat, I think, to me, consistent for that neighborhood. All right, it's the north side of Angelo's, consistent for that neighborhood. Um, Rick talks about that one that's elevated. It's probably two feet higher than the gable for the appropriate house. I think we have to look at that, but I think we also have to keep in mind, how much would it cost somebody to change that? Are we going to ask somebody to spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to change their carport? I'm not... I don't want to do that. I think that's a, there is some legislation that I think you or somebody put in um, on the end of our discussion where we have limits on how far we can go, but I would have a problem going through any one of these that I've seen and asking somebody to do something that was above ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, knowing that they probably don't have it. I mean, a lot of these homes are people that are middle-aged. It's that point where they don't have ten, fifteen thousand. Um, I have no problem with all the ones I've seen staying in right now, but I'm not the entire ZBA. There's things there, but if they're structurally sound, I would say we leave it at that, and we, we make our mark and we go forward. So we're saying they have to be meet uh, safety, but they also, <clears throat> if they fit within the neighborhood that we're talking about, we're not going to get into. I like it. You don't. She does, he doesn't, aesthetic approach to it. If it fits within the neighborhood, is consistent with the neighborhood, then aesthetically it fits. And that, I know, leaves a little bit of interpretation, but it helps define. But that's fair. That's, that's fair. fair interpretation there. I mean, it's, we're not forcing anything on anybody. We're giving everybody a chance to come through. Brenda, I think that's very fair. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment? Seeing none, let's take a vote. All those in favor, uh, please say yes. 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 <laughs> Are there any no's? Hearing no no's, it passes 7-0. Item C is the first reading and public hearing of an ordinance amending the budget for fiscal year beginning October 1, 2023 and ending September 30th, 2024 for six additional full-time positions in the street and bridge division. All right. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Patrick Frerich, the Director of Operations for the City. Um, come before you this morning with a proposal. Um, we as staff have sat down and, and tried to figure out ways to take care of some projects and some priorities that you, the city council and city management has placed upon us. And so this is one of those um, proposals that we think will we can make work. So let me go right into it. Um, in the end, what this is asking for is, is we're going to be asking for six additional FTEs to be added to the budget ordinance to accommodate a six man crew or six person crew within the street and bridge division that is gonna be primarily focused on ADA accessibility and sidewalks within the right of way. That's gonna be the primary function for this group. Um, 
two of the reasons for this request. Um, Lucy, I told you a little couple meetings ago that I have a plan for you. This is my plan. So I love good luck. hearing about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, the sidewalk improvements along Rick's Drive has been a topic of conversations for several years, so this will help address this, situ this uh, project, as well as the ADA accessibility improvements that have recently um, become more of a priority for the city um, in the last couple of years. So. Again, a little history on the Ricks Drive sidewalk. Councilwoman Gonzalez has been a champion of this particular project, and I know that it's been supported by several council members um, throughout the years. We've heard from a number of you guys saying that we really would like to, uh, to assist this area. I think to anyone that has driven down Ricks Drive and has seen um, the trails from the students that um, there, there's a big need for, for this sidewalk right well here. So. Worn. Um, it is well worn, worn in. Um, the students, thankfully, have helped us with that, showed us where the path needs to be. So, <laughs> yeah. um, again, we have a little history. We have applied for a grant for this particular project to put it in the sidewalk three times. And unfortunately, in all three attempts, we have not been successful on that. So, um, let's go ahead and do it ourselves. Um, let's just take care of this, is, is kind of our mentality on this. Um, so we, as the city, have um, scrimped and scrounged and found enough money within our street and bridge to budget to take care of contracting out, bidding out, and contracting out this sidewalk to the tune of just over a million dollars, which is our engineer and estimate is right at 1.1, so we're a little short, but we think we could handle it if we had to bid it out. Again, you may all, all may remember during the carryover process, um, you all assigned $275,000 that was left over from last year's streetlight budget into a dedicated ADA and accessibility connectivity fund for us. Um, we are tasked as in the operations department to utilize those funds to improve ramps within the right of way, as well as sidewalk and connectivity um, within that. Um, one of the struggles that I have with that is exactly how do we do that? Um, I think it's no secret that we have a lot of work to do within the street and bridge department already, um, just taking care of the roads and, and whatnot. So adding this um, burden to that group um, created a challenge for us. And so we have the ability to contract this work out, but when you contract it out, you are paying a premium for that work, especially on something that would be a small scale as $275,000 of sidewalk work would accommodate. So with those challenges, um, we sat down and, and we said, we have a million dollars. We can build Rick's Drive sidewalk and figure out this 275 later, or we can try something different. Um, and we crunched the numbers, we put it together, and we think, um, based on what we put together in our calculations, we rate that salary for this year and keep those individuals on for two additional years. The primary goal is number one, finish Lucy's sidewalk on Rick's Drive. We'll get that knocked out. We still have enough money within that $1 million to get the crew, provide them some equipment to do the work, and finish Rick's Drive in-house. So that kind of tells you a little bit about um, just kind of what we expect that premium to be if we bid it out. But the other bonus to this is we get two more years of work out of these individuals for the same money, and I can go spend that $275,000 times two years to do some much-needed ramp and, and other connectivity projects throughout the city. Um, we as staff are proposing that this has a, a three-year sunset to these positions just simply to because that's the money I have available to me right now. I think um, within that we'll see the need for this and so we can further that conversation later if we want to about what do we want to do after that, that three-year sunset, if we want to keep these, these positions or through attrition, we always have vacancies in Street and Bridge, we can eliminate those positions on paper but not necessarily have to let go of employees that are in those particular spots. So that is my ask, that is my proposal to you council this morning is to allow me to add six positions to Street and Bridge, get a sidewalk done, and get some other ADA um, projects taken care of in the next three years. I very much like the proposal, and I'm very much in supportive of it. I think financially it makes a lot of sense. My question is, are you going to be able to find those six FTEs? 
because it's one thing to budget and allocate it, it's another to hire them. And whether you can hire one of them or two of them or maybe three of them, but not all six of them, how does that impact the project? And you don't have to answer that. It's just a right. statement I'm making. Right. So for me, it makes so much sense. It gets a project done that has definitely been on the need-to-do list. Um, again, it's well-worn, so we know the path that needs to be taken. But my challenge is go find those six FTEs to make sure that this proposal actually turns into the project you want it to be. We'll make it successful. Okay. Other questions from council or comments? Tommy. Thanks, Patrick, um, for your creativity. Um, this is the sort of thing I think that makes San Angelo such a great place is we have, we have good employees, and we don't recognize that enough. So thank you for your for your uh, using your brain power and your creativity to come up with a, a solution to to something that was was needed. And congratulations, Lucy, on getting your getting it's your not side, done yet. Side <laughs> don't hold your breath. Well, I, it I, will tell you, get done. I will hold my breath. But we just don't know the start date. That's yes. all we're going to wait for is the start date. Right. Right. And with that being said, I move to approve. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that. Thank you. Any public comment concerning this item? Jamal Shumpert, single member district two. Uh, I'm in favor of this project as well, Mayor, but I do have a problem with the full-time employees. Uh, doing the salary back there in, in my head and on paper, it's about $30,000 a year to do side work work. That's pretty hard labor. I don't think you'll have a consistent full-time, six people consistently every day for three years doing that work. Maybe a year, but three years is kind of hard. I, I've done it myself, so that's what I'm telling you. Well, that's the reason I asked the question, can we find these people, et cetera, because the success of this program, which we need to be successful, is getting the people hired and sticking with us and making sure the projects get done. And, and, and it could have probably got done had he got the $800,000 grant, but... We didn't, and we've tried multiple times. So we, the project needs to be done. We're, we're going to do it in-house, which I like the fact that it uh, will be done at a, a much better price tag than if we had to go out on contract. So I think it's the right move and the right strategy. Yeah, I, I agree. I Thank agree. you for your comments. Hopefully we get to six. All right, so further public comment. Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All of those in favor, say yes. 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 Are there any no's? Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. you, Patrick, <laughs> for your hard work. Yay. We will now move down to our closed session, the executive session on the provision of government code title 5, open government ethics, subtitle A, open government chapter 551, Open meetings, subchapter D, exceptions to requirement that meetings be open under their following sections. A, section 551.072, deliberations about real property regarding the lease with Santa Fe Depot. We are now adjourned until we finish this conversation.
come and don't know what that secondary thing is. This meeting is officially called back to order at 10.43 a.m. Um, there are no announcements to make following the closed session, so we will move into the follow-up and administrative issues, which consist of item B, consider approving various board nominations for Concho Museum Board, Ewell Lettermilk. That's a, that's a tough name to get out there. SMD 6 to first term ending January 2026 and the Zoning Board of Adjustment, Richard Rebus. SMD 4 to an unexpired term ending January 2025. Do I have an, a motion for approval of those two board nominations? So moved. Second. There has, there has been a motion and a second. Any public comment? Seeing none, hearing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 7-0. Any announcements in consideration of future agenda items at this point? Do not see or hear any, so I would take a motion for adjournment, please. A motion second by Tommy, third. second by Lucy. All those in favor, say aye. Stand aye. up and go. Aye. aye. Yeah, stand up and go. <laughs>